Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Liz from SWP. Um, Clara today is absent, so I will be taking her place. Um, we are just going to pick up where we left off uh, last week, and Bruce is going to um, take it away. Okay, thanks, Liz. Hello, everyone. This is Bruce again. Um, this is the second lecture about Pears Geoscope. And in this lecture, I'll cover actual functions that we can write, that we can launch into pairs and work on data in pairs. As you recall, pairs is designed to do a lot of calculations with very big data without actually moving the data. So I'll show you how that works. I'll use soil moisture as an example. I, I showed you uh, some images of soil moisture last time. Some of those were from um, a user-defined function. I'll also show you how to use a user-defined function and retrieve data and then do some local processing. This will lead to a, a movie of ocean temperature over the Atlantic Ocean versus time. I'll show you an example with an enormous reduction of data, about several billion, studying Australia fires to see if there's a correlation with temperature. And I'll show you other examples having to do with water detection or vegetation. So you'll recall from last time <clears throat> that Pears Geoscope contains thousands of data layers plus analytics to work with that data at the source inside the nodes where that data resides. So the data does not have to be transferred to another computer or to your laptop in order to work with it as separate files. It's got nearly five petabytes of data and it's curated in the sense that the data usually comes in as files from some satellite imagery service or some a weather a simulation service or wherever. And the files are broken down into their individual pixels. And the pixels are put on a hierarchical grid at the appropriate resolution. And that grid ranges in scale from about a millionth, well, starting exactly at a millionth of a degree on the equator, to about oh, eight degrees or so at the largest scale. The thousands of data layers already in pairs, a data layer might be temperature or precipitation or cloud cover or snowfall. I'll show you an example of fire detection. It could be uh, satellite images or process satellite images which come from a data source and so on. Users can upload their own data. We got a question about that last time, which I answered a couple hours later by email, in fact, uh, yes, this is possible. Um, in our team here, we are currently writing a tutorial on how to do that. Um, it's not totally unlimited with because uh, of the potential of enormi enormous amounts of data, but um, but with sensible use, it can be very uh, uh, advantageous for someone with their own data who'd like to combine that with data already in pairs. And then there are analytics capabilities, and I'll show you more about that today. So for example, we can answer a question like this, show me agricultural areas. So that's one kind of data layer, namely uh, vegetation indexes or perhaps government crop information, where the amount of rain, so now that's another type, that's um, meteorological data, presumably simulations. In the last month, so here we want to integrate over all the rain for the last month. 80% below, so now that's a logical operation, and I'll show you a logical operation in Python um, at the end of this talk. Below historical averages. So there again, we have to average even larger amounts of data to determine a historical average. So these kinds of questions combining multiple data and arithmetic operations on multiple data are possible, and they're very fast because we don't have to move the data until the last minute until we get the answer, and then we, we move the data finally to a, a local processor. Why is this all put together? Because as I said last time, data usefulness 
increases when it can be combined with other data. And data now is too big to move. A terabyte, for example, a typical a satellite output for a day is, is, takes a whole day to read off a disk drive. So it's really impractical to take geo-Earth type data, especially with many different time snaps, in file form, bring it to your computer, and then look inside those files for interesting things. Combine them perhaps with um, uh, surveillance images or uh, cell phone images, uh, and then uh, make a useful conclusion from that. It's much easier, and in, in fact, for large data, only possible to start with big reservoirs where the data is already curated. Curated once, useful many times by many different people. And so because data is too big to move and because it attracts other data, there's a kind of gravity and big data systems just get bigger. So last time I told you uh, how to use the very simplest application on pairs, the graphical user interface with an example called My Vacation. And I'll remind you what that was and show you how that GUI can be used to get a, a little information. I left you with this image and I zoomed in to the satellite image and to the map image and showed you an interesting site for a, vocation, for a vacation in Botswana, down around here where the temperature's nice. But you see, I can put the mouse here, for example, and hover, and it'll tell me the latitude and the longitude, and it'll tell you the value which is the temperature of that place. So I can do that anywhere here. I can look over on the left and I have some options. I can save this as a favorite or I can click public and then I can send the link to someone else and they can get my result. Or I can go up here and look at some actions. Now, what can I do? I can take this and I can download the data. So let's click on that. It says, what do you want to do with this zip file? Well, I can save it on my computer now. I'll just cancel that. Or I can download a map. What do you want to do with vacation PNG? I can save that on my computer. Or I can clone it. If I clone it, that means I take the whole um, data a layer and the operation I did to get this. And I can start all over again with the same things, but I can modify it a little bit. Well, I won't do that right now. What else can I do? Developer tools. I can go inside here and read some of the text that was used to make this. The name is vacation. Description. Is it public? False, because I haven't clicked that little box yet. The space, well, the ID space is right here. That's all of Africa. 36798 is the space ID for Africa. Is favorite? False, because I didn't click that as a favorite. Layer, data layer, 49430. This is the temperature. Starting time, 621, 2019, zero hours. So that's June 21st last year, because I was interested in the temperature in Africa on the first day of my uh, summer with no filters. Or I can look at uh, the query results. So these are some of the things I can do with a very simple graphical user interface. Let's go on to other things. So now let's start again at the beginning of Pairs Geoscope. And before I showed you examples and I showed you queries and I showed you the data explorer, this time I wanna highlight this documentation button, which will take me to this window. And I have a choice of API with tutorials. Now that's very useful. And I recommend anyone starting to look at pairs, go to these tutorials. If you click on that, it'll take you to this website, which you could go independently of the GUI. And there'll be many examples starting at the very basics to learn how to um, retrieve data with, say, uh, Python programs, how to plot, how to do uh, logical operations, and so on. So let's look at analytics. We want to do as much as possible without moving the data at all. We want to do the analytics on the platform. 
and then bring only the final result to our computer. But there are various steps, the various points where we could break that process and bring things to the computer, depending on what we want to do and what we want to do locally. So toward the top of this diagram is more user friendly. That's the GUI I showed you before. I could just click a few things and get a lot of information. And I can download that and do other things with it. Or I can have the second arrow here, user defined function, UDF, which I'll show you about in a minute. I can do those in Jupyter notebooks or on Spark frames. And I can bring all of that to local tools and do a lot, anything I like locally. I'll show you that full set of processes now. So let's look at a Python program to calculate something I showed you before, a yearly soil index, which is the soil moisture. I want to go back through some period of time, and in this case, 2008 to 2019, 12 years. For each year, I want the mean soil moisture, and it'll be down to seven centimeters, and I can pick other depths. That's just one layer in every pixel in a map. So I want to determine this for every year and then determine the average for all the years and the variance around that average for all of these years. And then I want to launch a new query for each year that calculates the mean soil moisture again. But now I want to subtract the average and divide by the variance to see if the soil moisture is more than average or less than average for that year in proportion to the variance. How big are the fluctuations? And I showed you results from this process before when we talked about drought in Kenya. So now I want to show you some pieces of that Python code. This all starts with the beginning, importing various routines, importing NumPy and so on. But I just want to highlight that Pairs has its own wrapper, PAW. So I can import from IBM Pairs this Pairs application wrapper, which contains all of the uh, language I need to launch um, queries into the Pairs database. So I'll define a starting year and an ending year, and I make a list. So a Python loop for year in the range from the start to the end. Now I'm gonna make a layer, and this layer will be launched as a query inside Pairs. You'll see that on the next page. But the layer contains some name. I'm going to start with R, maybe I'm thinking of rain or just some general uh, term that I can use to remember it for that year. And that what I'm going to launch is a raster. So that's going to give me a map. And the map will have a certain layer number, which 49450, I know that's the soil moisture down to a certain depth. I'm going to have a value of that moisture every hour. That's going to have 30 kilometers resolution. I want to take all those values and take the mean of them in this time interval, which is January 1st of that year to January 1st of the beginning of the next year. So I want to take a mean for a whole year of soil moisture down to seven centimeters. Do I want to output that? No, I don't, because I don't want to return that layer. So here I've made a layer and I'm going to add that to my list. So now I want to take the mean and the mean square and the variance. So I can define some operations and I can have arithmetic expressions, which have usual arithmetic form. And here I show you what the uh, variance is. And I can add those to the list. So now I have a long list containing all of the layers layers of data that I want, plus some arithmetic operations. I'm going to put those into a JSON query. And JSON is a, a term. It stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's a common format for data. And it's useful when we have key value pairs, which is how pairs is organized. So I'm going to put all those layers into my query. I'm going to define a spatial region. And this is a polygram, meaning the boundaries of the region are labeled by points, an area of interest, and this is a layer for an area of interest that corresponds to Kenya. And in the JSON query, I always need some time snap 
but that's overrided by the previous timestamp that I put in there itself, right here, the starting and ending time. So this is kind of a dummy right now. So here's my query. It uses that pairs application wrapper. So enter all of these things, plus the server information that tells which pair server it's going to, and my credentials that give me the right to use it. I'm going to launch the query here and finally download the layers. And after I've done that, I'm going to keep track at the end of all this of the mean uh, soil amounts and the, and the variance. So this is a yearly value in every pixel, the mean soil amount and the variance year to year. So already by this time, I've reduced the data for a whole year's worth of hourly data into mean yearly values. Now I want to go back in, launching these queries is easy. Start all over again, and now I want a particular year. Again for Kenya. And this time I want to output the data because I want a map of that year, because I want to subtract the mean and divide by the variance. Launching my second query. And here I've retrieved that data which is uh, given to me in this form. This is the alias for that form. Here's the query to the actual data, and I can retrieve it in this now soil array. I want to subtract mean soil, divide by the variance, and now make a map. And this is the kind of map I showed you last time. So you see, I have a lot of flexibility in Python or in Spark frames, and I showed you Python, to manipulate that data inside pairs and then to retrieve it as a uh, as an image or i could bring that locally so now i'll show you a little different tool here i've written the user defined function and i'm not showing you that function to make a map of the average temperature across the whole atlantic ocean for every month from 1980 to 2018 and i brought that to my computer and i made a movie so i'm showing you a movie month by month you can see the seasons come and go. The temperature's high in the red. So in the summertime, the Atlantic Ocean, this goes from this lower right-hand corner, which is the northwest tip of Africa, all the way up to New England here, showing the whole northern Atlantic Ocean. And it's warm in this part in the summertime, and it, it gets uh, very cool in the northern Atlantic in the wintertime. And I'm interested maybe in hurricanes. Hurricane season, of course, is when the ocean surface temperature is warm. So now instead of defining Kenya as my polygon area of interest, I can put in any coordinates I like. And this goes from latitude 19.5 to 40, that's the Northern uh, Atlantic region, for a longitude minus 71 out to minus 21. That takes me from New England to Northwest African coast. And before where I had the soil moisture, now I'm gonna put in the sea surface temperature, which is another layer that comes from ECMWF. So I'll just generate lots and lots of maps, 468 maps. That's 39 years of monthly data. So I've reduced what was originally temperature data over this grid, several billion values, down to 456 maps, about 300,000 data points. I take the maps to my ThinkPad, and I use some program to make a movie of them. So that's a, an example how I can go inside pairs with a Python program, manipulate data, retrieve a rather small amount, and that's just some number of maps, and then do something locally on my ThinkPad. In this case, I wanted to make a movie. So now let's do some science. I'm interested in the biggest news item worldwide, I think, in the last year. We're watching these wildfires in Australia, and oh my gosh, it's so such a tragedy. And I'm thinking, well, global warming, Let's see if I can tease that out of the data. Do wildfires correlate with high temperatures? Well, this is a tricky problem because temperature varies a lot. It varies from January to June. It varies from year to year. And wildfires also vary seasonally. So I don't want to just plot wildfires versus temperature because all I'll see is the seasonal data. So I have to do a lot of thinking. I want to take out those seasons. 
So let's see what we can do. Historical data on wildfires. Now you can tell this if you just do a search on wildfires into Data Explorer, it will take you to this layer. So it happens to be layer 50035. And what that gives is the daily burned areas measured in pixels of a half a kilometer squared. And it just has a value of one if a satellite, the MODIS satellite, indicates through some um, use of different color filters, a value of one if there's been some uh, burning in that region, and a value of zero if there hasn't. So now I can have a small fire. It doesn't have to be a half a kilometer. And if there's a small fire anywhere in that pixel that MODIS sees, it'll give a value of one. So when I say burn, area, it's just going to be the sum of all these pixel areas. It's not going to be the true fire area, because that can be a small part of each pixel. Nevertheless, this is a good measure of fire and burned areas. And I want to find the total burned area in this sense every month for this period 2001 to 2018, because that's the data I have value um, in, in MODIS. MODIS was launched in around uh, 2000. There are actually two MODIS satellites launched in the 1999 to 2000 era. But I want to combine that with temperature data. So I'll use ECFWM. That's what you saw from last time. I can use the reanalysis. That's not ERA5. ERA5, which I mentioned before, is 0.25 degree pixels. This is 0.75. I don't care so much. By 80 kilometer resolution, I just want to get uh, some global climate information. This comes every six hours. So it's not a tremendous amount of data. It's layer 48552. And I want to find the monthly average air temperature. And this layer gives me that value determined from the weather at two meters above the ground. Now I want to combine all the monthly burned areas for all of these years and get the monthly average and the average temperature for all these years to determine the average yearly profile. So what's the average for January? What's the average for February? And so on, combining all these years to get these averages. And then I want to ratio each month's burned area, January 2005, to the average of January two, uh, for all years, and plot versus the excess temperature for that month compared to the average temperature for that month. This is a way I can get rid of the seasonal data. So the data sizes, the burned area, that's enormous. A half a kilometer, 500 meters of all of Australia, that's 10,000 squared once per day, that's uh, nearly a trillion data values. And most of it's empty. This is extremely sparse data. And sometimes no data might come back at all. And I'll have to work with a NAN data sets. The temperature pixels, 30 kilometers, that's not such a big grid. So that's only a couple billion values. The final data is only the months. I have a single burned sum for every month in this 18-year interval. So that's 218 numbers. Same for temperature, another 200, well, 216 numbers, 216 each year times two, 433 numbers. So that's an enormous reduction in the data, about um, 2 billion. So here's a map of the fire burned area in Australia month to month for this period from 2001 to 2018. You see there's a seasonal variation. There are more fires in the summer months than there are in the winter months. Well, here's the temperature. So there's also a seasonal variation. It's much more regular for temperature. And if I were to just plot fire area versus temperature, I wouldn't find much. There are high temperature months without much burning and low temperature months without much burning and the low temperature months with considerable burning, and similarly with lots of burning. So I'm not gonna see any general trend here. I have to take out that seasonal data. So I can do this in Python. I wanna determine the month to month average in this range. So I can just take the average of the sum fire range for all the months, and I could do this modulo 12. So I just I'll divide that into 12, equal segments, January through February. And I want to do the same for um, temperature to get the average. Then I want to take the excess fire burn for that month of June, say, compared to the average, and the excess, and I'll do that as a ratio, and I'll take the excess temperature as a degrees. 
and here's a plot. So on the x-axis is the temperature excess in degrees centigrade. So a particular month, say June 2010, might be one and a half degrees average than the average for June of all that time period. And the fire area, a particular dot here might be uh, June 2010 for fire, and it might have some fire area of that particular June 2010, and compared to the monthly Junes for all that time period, it has a value which may be high or low. It's one of these points. I can do a fit for that, and lo and behold, I see there's not much of a trend. My hopes are dashed, and I'm gonna see an immediate climate change trend either for temperature or fires. I need a longer base time. And you can find online studies that go back to much longer times, which might suggest there's a global warming trend. But remember that global warming is really only fractions of a degree. It's a half a degree for normal uh, temperate zones. We're worried about two degrees as a tipping point. That's globally. Temperate zones might be less, the poles might be more. So I'm not expecting very big changes. and the the monthly changes are so much more. And even the yearly statistical variations are more. So to tease out climate type variations, even though I have lofty goals, it's a hard thing to do. But you can see that with enormous amounts of data, it might be possible. And I showed you some trends before, which were uh, yearly trends, drought or rain in various areas. And that can be statistically quite significant integrated over countries or pixel wise in a map. But after we, if we want to go after climate data, even in large regions, although there's an enormous amount of data, we need really all we have at our fingertips to boil that down into just a few data values. And then we hope to see something. And I don't really see much statistically significant in this very interesting area of fire versus temperature for this rather short range, 19 year range in Australia. Well, let's do something else. In the United States, tornadoes are a hot topic. I'm not sure you have tornadoes there. I know you have coastal storms, you have big damaging storms on land, but tornadoes are really amazing and they can do enormous amount of very concentrated damage. And here's one from last October that hit Dallas. Often these tornadoes just go in the countryside. They do a lot of damage to farms. They do damage to suburbs. When one hits a city, it's really a, a, a rare event because cities don't occupy much area. And cities also tend to have warm footprints. So it's not clear tornadoes really like them. But here's one that went through a part of Dallas and destroyed buildings and killed someone. So I'd like to see that. Where did it go? So I can go on high resolution Sentinel data inside pairs. And here's a little snapshot of a Python program. Just to show you what you can do, I like Sentinel. If 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 we have the Sentinel data, it's very high resolution, 10 meter. So we don't have all of it on pairs, but we have it for this time. So I'm going to a time that borders when the tornado was. The tornado happened October 21st. So I want to go right after the tornado, October 22nd, 2019. I want to take some time before, whatever there is when the Sentinel passed over. So I'll pick October 7th. I don't want any output, but I do want to look at a red image before and after. And the, what I want to output is just the difference image. So that's my expression, which I'll bring to my computer. What's the difference in the red image before and after this tornado? And can I actually see it? And I don't want to just go to Texas. I want to narrowly define the Dallas region. So I'll put in these coordinates for Dallas. See, it's a very narrow latitude range, 32.84 to 32.96, and a very narrow longitude range, 96.9 negative to 96.7. And again, I don't really uh, care about the time window here because I've defined that up above. Well, here it is. That's the difference image. And I can see that tornado path. The downtown Dallas area is up here. We have some suburbs of Dallas and the tornado, it's a wiggly little path, does damage and leaves a trail of damage, which actually looks different, darker, red here, darker in the red image than that same red image 
a couple of weeks before. <clears throat> Let's do something else. Let's go back to Africa, around the Lake Victoria region. And I want to look at water and vegetation there. So here's a map. So I can see where water is, lots of little lakes. It's big, beautiful Lake Victoria. But I want to look at this in a modern way with satellite images. So I can take what's called a normalized difference water index, same thing as what you saw before, green minus the short wavelength infrared, because water does not reflect in the short wavelength infrared. So this will look, this will have a value of about one, because SWIR will be near zero for water. So the water index will be about one if I'm looking at water, it'll be about zero if I'm not looking at water. And I also want to look at the normalized difference vegetation index because chlorophyll for all kinds of vegetation reflects strongly in the near infrared. So this will be about one if I'm looking at vegetation and it'll be very low if I have other structures. And you can read about these indices here. So I'd like to do this inside pairs. So I go to the green band in modus aqua. The green band is about 500 nanometers. It's got a half a kilometer resolution. And I want to zero in on this region surrounding Lake Victoria on or near a certain date. So here's that green band, that layer 49786. I want to go to a square with these coordinates. This is right around Lake Victoria. And I can tell these coordinates, by the way, if I just go in the GUI, make a map of the world and hover, it'll tell me the coordinates. So I can always find the coordinates easily. And I want a snapshot around um, May 31st, because I'm expecting uh, that to show me some uh, something interesting. Here I'll look at the infrared band. So that's the short wavelength infrared. And this should show no reflection in water areas. So here's the green band all by itself in a color scale going from no green light coming off the earth to green light measured 0.08 in energy units. So green light is also barely reflecting in water. So I can see water right here. But if I look at the short wavelength infrared, it's even more extreme. The numerical values of the reflections are much higher, 0.35 here. So if I difference these, I see an extreme difference between the water areas, which are now high, numerical value of one, very blue, and the non-water areas, which are very low, minus one or red. You can see all the little water areas, just like what's on this map, even the tiny little regions that are not on the map. So that's very useful. Or if I'm interested in vegetation, there's a layer already inside pairs because this is put out as a product that's very useful for people. ID layer 51, and I'll go to the same coordinates around Lake Victoria, and I'll go to the same date. And now I choose to plot this in green because I think of vegetation as green. And here's the vegetation where higher values go from zero to one mean more vegetation. And I can even see some green areas, some parkland, which are also shown in my map, but also many other areas of vegetation. So this is good to study crops, or it's good to look at uh, civic infrastructure. It's good to look at uh, a general a greenery, again, and for climate studies. We could sum up all the green area and so on. Here's NDVI in a different region. This is just the Congo River. I thought, well, hey, this would be interesting. Let's see all the lush vegetation around the Congo. So this is just with the GUI. At higher resolution than the MODIS, this is another product of MODIS, but it's a quarter of a kilometer. And just like in the GUI, I have choices here. MODIS, aqua, 16-day normalized. I choose 16-day, so it already takes out the clouds. NDVI. And here's a grayscale, or color scale in this case, from zero to one. I can see those lakes again. Well, I can make the same 
now with the user defined function, zeroing in on this Congo River using the short wavelength infrared band. Here's the MODIS NDVI at higher resolution. And it's amazing. You can see the Congo. It's a huge river, sometimes a kilometer wide. And I can see this pretty easily at a quarter kilometer resolution. And now here, the one I just showed you at a half kilometer resolution. Those pixels are half kilometer, but still uh, they're wide enough to show the main parts of the Congo River. You recall from last lecture, that there was severe flooding a couple of years ago in East Africa. Now we have a tool that can look at standing water. Here in the Horn of Africa, this is where the floods occurred. This is from May 16th, when there was such severe flooding. Remember, the, the rain started quite early, March. And at this time by May, uh, the flooding was also uh, quite pervasive. Well, now let's go early time when there was drought the same year. This is January 1st, 2018. And here's the NDWI at 500 meter resolution in this region. And here it is at the time of the drought, the time that newspaper article was written. And look carefully, look at all these blue regions. These are all standing water where there shouldn't be standing water. This is the flood. I don't know if you could see them on your screen, but they're clear here. These little blue individual pixels. You recall last time I mentioned the Cape Storm, June 7th. Here it talks about wind speed. Well, let's look at those wind speeds. Wind speed is a layer. You remember I showed you precipitation. That's that's the layer now zoomed in again from the GUI. And here's the same region with wind speed as a function of time. And I've picked just the date I want, June 7. And it shows you a color scale of wind speed in meter per second. I can look at this color scale from zero to 50 meters per second. That's a pretty strong wind. Here's Cape Town. So this is off in the Atlantic Ocean. This would be wind speed on Cape Town. And right off the coast, there's a pretty severe wind. We could do the same thing now with a GUI. And I want to show you how to use a, a logical function. Let's go to June, June 5th and 9th, 2017. These are all the gusts, the maximum wind in that period. So that is centered on the period of the storm. And here are the gusts, a little map. I've taken the maximum in that four, five day interval. Gusts going from zero up to 35, 36, 37 meters per second. It shows you where the gusts are. And here's that storm, high gusts in the Cape Town area. But maybe I want to do something with those high gusts. I want to see if they damage crops, NDVI, or anything. So I just want to take out the region in South Africa where that severest dusts occurred. So I want to do filtering. So this is a general capability of pairs. I haven't mentioned yet, but it's very useful. It allows you to do complex queries like I showed you early on today and last time. Give me all the vegetation areas where there's been a certain precipitation in the last uh, recent time greater than a, a certain amount. Well, I just add a filter line with an expression. And I can have many Boolean operators here. Again, I pick this date range. This is how I made map. I can pick a map, I'll aggregate the maximum in this time period, and I'll go in the region of South Africa. So now these lines of Python code should be familiar to you. The only difference here is that I put in a logical expression. I'm doing this filtering inside the node where the data resides. So again, I'm only going to bring back to my local computer, the minimal amount of data and make a map of that. And so here's the region plotted with the same color scale as before. And this is what it looked like before, but now just showing where the wind gusts, the wind speeds exceed 20 meters per second. And here's the 20 mark. You can see it just shows the blue regions. And now I can do something with that data um, 
combine it with other data, for example, and I'm not going to do that right now. It also says in this Wikipedia article about the severe storm that there were wave heights, nine to 12 meters. That's a pretty strong wave. I don't want to be out in that water if I'm in a boat. So if I'm interested in wave height, I can go back to the GUI, to the data explorer, just enter the keyword wave height, and it'll take me to this layer. It'll explain a little bit about the wave height. So I can click on this view and geoscope button. And I showed you how to do this last time. And I'll pick up this geoscope view. I can zoom in on the storm, June 5th to June 10th. That's every hour value, all those little dots. And I can click on one of these and get a map of what the wave height distribution is all in the ocean around South Africa. And here's the units of meters from zero to 20 meters on this date of June 7th. So I can understand that storm and what this article is writing about using data in pairs. So let's conclude. And then I'll show you uh, an example of a Python code running. Geospatial temporal data is big data. There's no way around that. We have hourly data, which is interesting on a human scale, but for the whole earth, in a year's time, that's 10 gigabytes of data. An earth map at a, a quarter degree resolution at the equator, that's 25 kilometers, is a million pixels. Elevation data from satellites is even more intense, 30 meter. It's very useful if you're on foot climbing around. It's very useful if you're building bridges or want to see if your neighborhood's going to flood. It's not so useful for at that resolution for temperature data because temperature varies much more slowly, unless you're in a strong weather front. But that's an enormous amount of data. In Africa, it's 135 gigabytes. Combining this with weather, images, street map, and so on, you can see how Earth data in time can easily exceed a few petabytes. So this is big data. It can't be moved. Storage and retrieval with files, which can be moved. You can move individual files, even a gigabyte. If you wait a while, maybe an hour, you can get a gigabyte file. But that's not efficient. And doing that for many files and hundreds of people all doing that for, say, Australia, because that's in the news, it's not efficient. And the servers that offer those files have to do a lot of work and maybe it'll be a, a roadblock. But Pairs takes that data already, curates it, and puts it on a hierarchical grid. So you only have to get it once, and Pairs does that for you and then using it is much easier. The resolution varies depending on the grid point, the, the level of the grid from 11 centimeters, which is more than enough for the satellite images or weather images, but that's useful if you have a drone data or a, a LIDAR data or other things to 940 kilometer pixels with one second time resolution. It uses a key value storage method, which is very efficient and can be uh, scaled up in an extreme way. You access the data in an easy way with a GUI or with user-defined functions. It works on the cloud, in Spark data frames. You can run functions in your own laptop. You can run functions, or we do here anyway, maybe some of you can there, on the pair server itself. And the objective here, and really the objective for all big data analytics, is to try to do as much of that data manipulation and calculation right on the same node that is attached to the hard drive that contains the data. OK, so let's see if we can go to, uh, I showed you this before. Let's go to a Jupyter Lab. And this is an exercise 
that's going to look at monthly precipitation in Kenya. Now I import data, import PAW time, and let's see that, let's make sure that that's working. Yeah, that's going pretty well. I can click down. I'd, I've showed you some of these before. I just time the time frame. And now I'm going to look at 2018. I'm going to launch that. Got a little clock. So that's going to start to tick away in about 30 or 40 seconds. It'll have something. And I'll just describe this. I don't know if you can see this where you are, but um, just go through it. I'll define a year and I do a loop over months. I have a, a starting time of the big, um, for that year, the beginning of the month, the first day of the month, the ending time depends on whether it's December, in which case I have to flip over to the next year. I put in an ID, which is the total precipitation. I take a mean of that for the entire month. I'm just going to call it rain. It's a raster scan. And my time interval, as I said, is for that month. And I do want to output it because I want a, a map of the mean precipitation for every month. So there I've made a layer. I define a, a, a JSON query by putting in that layer, by putting in the spatial position and area of interest of Kenya. And again, this is a dummy time snapshot because I've defined the time above. Here I launch the layer in wait. Um, and I keep track of the time. So now my first month has come out. It's taken 31 seconds. I made this little plot. And let's see if I have some other months. Oh, here's the next one. 31 seconds, that's month two. It's still working on month three and so on. So um, this is a typical and, and still rather simple exercise, just a few lines. Um, but it shows you, now that one took 41 seconds. It depends in some sense on who else is using this. And this will continue to go along for all the months in the year that I specified, which was 2012. OK, so that's the end of my presentation. We've been about. 50 minutes. I'll leave it at the conclusions and ask if anyone has some questions. Thank you. So, um, Liz, are you there? I am. Hi. Sorry about that. Um, Hi, good. Thank you so much, uh, Bruce, for that. Uh, I think that we have a question that I'm going to allow the person, uh, Rodolfo, I'm going to turn your mic on so that you can ask the question. There you go. Hi, Rodolfo. Hi, Rodolfo. Hi, how are you? Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, um, I think you show a lot of the power of uh, uh, how to visualize, you know, a uh, big amount of data. But one question that I have is, um, as you show the example of uh, chlorophyll A in, uh, in Lake Victoria, if, um, if, if, if you guys kind of have looked at, for example, looking at different data layers uh, that could be the cause, for example, of more uh, chlorophyll A, like uh, let's say rainfall in the previous days and the temperature and so on, and uh, do some queries, but kind of do these data analytics about um, looking at um, possible correlations between, um, you know, temperature layer, uh, rainfall layer, um, uh, flooding layer, whatever, something that kind of um, infer about the, why are we getting so much chlorophyll A in the lake uh, um, and, and what could be tied to the what? What are the factors uh -huh. that may have been affected that? And this kind of more of the I was just thinking, you know, uh, sometimes we may know what factors affect, but I guess this is kind of a I don't know if this is the machine learning type of thing that we want to see where you have you put a lot of layers and say let me give me some correlations between um, what's going on if there is a correlation between rainfall or uh, temperatures and chlorophyll A and, uh, 
and then, then I can just think about uh, how you process this data. And I wonder if this is something that you guys have done uh, with uh, multiple layers of data just to figure out uh, what's triggering what. Uh, yeah, so a very good question. This is a deep question. So let me let me give several answers to this. Uh, first of all, I showed you the NDVI, the Vegetation Index, and that was that green plot, and we can go back to that if you like. Uh, um, and you're interested in, in Lake Victoria. Now, what I showed you actually has whiteness for Lake Victoria, because it's not showing chlorophyll. So this is the, the crop area, the forest area. And yes, there's been a lot of study and interest on how particularly um, cash crops, farmland, uh, corresponds or responds to rainfall, um, uh, temperature variations, storms, storm damage, things like that, uh, flooding. Uh, this is a, a, has a lot of business use, has use for insurance companies, has use for government checking whether um, a green areas vegetation have been cut down, whether um, primeval forest has been cut down to make farms, because there are certain regulations in how much of that can happen. It's an easy way to check um, uh, uh, whether uh, someone has violated uh, local uh, regulations. But you ask about algae, you ask about the chlorf chlorophyll in, in a lake. And the first fundamental problem is that uh, the water surface reflects a lot of light. So if the algae is just underwater, and most of it is just floating underwater, you're not gonna see it. If it's kind of a scum, at the edge of the lake on the shore, which often it is because the uh, wind will blow it to the surface where it, where it stacks up as a, a scummy green layer on the, on the shore, then you could see that. So yes, this would be a very interesting exercise. I'm not aware anyone has done it. Now you can do it. You zero in on some shoreline of Lake Victoria, get the highest resolution you can, which might be a 500 meters, or maybe you can get sentinel data at 10 meters and you take uh, a standard image of before, and you take an image when you, you know there's some algae, and you could difference the two using this NDVI that you make yourself, not necessarily what comes from the satellite, or you can take the satellite image. And you could subtract those two. Let's just take the satellite image. Inside pairs, two different dates, subtract it right inside pairs, bring the difference uh, to your computer, and you could see where there inside Lake Victoria, there's excess algae and probably around the shore. Now you have a measure of excess algae in the lake. Now you can, you know what to look for. So you can go back inside pairs on different dates. You can go every day of the year. You can do temperature and precipitation. You can make some arithmetic combination of temperature and precipitation, weighted by some amount uh, with temperature, some amount with precipitation. However you like to do that, maybe humidity, you can do soil moisture, weight them all together into a single, now it's a Rudolfo quantity. And we can combine that, perhaps superimpose that on, on the lake algae data, which you've gotten by another process by differencing NDVI. So now you can understand the value of combining all this data and the value of having it at your fingertips. You'd write programs to do this, it's not a CAN function. Maybe no one's ever done it before. So this is research. You want this ability to write programs. It's not something easily gotten with a graphical user interface. Although in the GUI, you could uh, highlight and zero in to every one of the layers you're interested in. And all of those layers will be in the GUI and you can just click from one to the other. But it's more useful to do the arithmetic uh, that gives you just the kind of function and just the kind of uh, retrieval that you want. So that's a good question. It's a deep question. And I encourage you or anyone else to start playing around in a science fashion. Uh, you may discover something very interesting and important. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next question is from Christopher. I'm going to unmute you. Um, I hope you're ready. Christopher, yeah, could you hi. ask your question, please? Yes. Hi, can you hear? Yes, Yeah. Hi. perfectly. Hi, I'm from the uh, Resilient Waters program, and um, I'm the digital 
development specialist on that. Um, I would just have a couple of quick questions. Um, some I missed last week's, but I was there for the first one. So this may have been answered with regard to Geoscope, but um, how does the one's really basic, like is this a subscription-based model? Is there an, um, sort of a, a fee to access um, the, the imagery or higher prices for more, more detailed imagery um, versus sort of the, the free free version? Um, and then is, is there, can you then connect up some of like the information or analyses that you do through an API or something to some other application and or can you build sort of what you were just mentioning running uh doing programs like building like a like on top of the application like a like the python script or something to do sort of like you know stream flow estimates or some or something like that um is that would that be done inside of the actual geoscope or is that or an application you build outside of it that sort of connects up to the data and sort of does data calls into in into the into the platform Okay. Um, and, say, and same question is, can we do like sort of land use over time? Is that part of the platform as well? Thank you. Okay, good. So you are with the Brazilian water program of some sort. Is that a government agency? Uh, it's a USAID funded regional program in Southern Africa. So I'm based in Pretoria. Uh, okay. I'm focusing on improving transboundary wa uh, water management among other okay. things. Okay. So, um, Yes, uh, there are subscriptions. Uh, there's a freemium version to play around. Um, you you may want to, as an organization, get a subscription or or team with a government agency who could use this, perhaps in Brazil or perhaps in South Africa. Um, this is a higher level decision than I can uh, give, so I can uh, return uh, details about that, or you can just check with IBM representatives. Um, if you give your email to um, Liz or to Cebu, then uh, we can get back with some details for how to do that. So yes, there are various ways to access the data, depending on subscription, various types of data you can get. Um, and, and much of this data also comes from primary sources, satellite data and so on which you can access uh, since often that is government data, European Space Agency, NASA, often that data in raw form is free. Um, but as I said, it's hard, to, complicated to use compared to this. So you have some choices. Um, in terms of connecting to other applications, uh, yes, you can, as I mentioned, you could either load your own data as, not, as long as it's not petabytes worth, your own data into pairs and use everything there. It can be put on the same grid as everything else, which is very useful, on the same uh, time grid and space grid, allowing you to do uh, uh, various types of math operations on your, your data combined with existing pairs data. Or if there's a certain data source that you really, really like uh, and the pairs group uh, realizes that would be useful in general, uh, it could be uploaded here by the pairs group, and then many more people could use it. So that's a possibility. And as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this, uh, the uh, tutorial for how to actually upload your own data is being written now. And I think a time scale for that to come out is just a couple of weeks. At least that's what I was told last, last week. Um, you can build your own program and put as part of that uh, various other programming, such as Python parts. And now, you asked whether that can be done inside pairs or outside. And now if, if your program has data outside and you want to combine pairs data outside, then you would want to retrieve that data. So there uh, I showed you examples, output equals false, output equals true. If output is false, you're just using it inside pairs. You do all this arithmetic operations inside pairs. And you don't want all that data. You just want some arithmetic expression. Output equals true, you're actually taking that data probably in image form or in comma separated values, however you want it. So in this case, you would take it out as uh, numerical values as some big array. And if that's what you want to do, combine that locally in your laptop or some system with whatever data you have already. And now, now you have the data. It's, it's yours, you, you keep it, you do whatever you want with it. There are certain restrictions on some data 
um, that's provided, so, uh, perhaps uh, government data, European data or weather information uh, provides uh, for use, but uh, they have restrictions, licensing agreements. So you can't, for example, take large amounts of it and sell it because they're a provider um, and, and anyone who wants it should get it from them. So um, there are certain restrictions for what to do with pairs data, but the exercise you mentioned of taking it, combining it with your own, what is given by pairs is already curated data. It's not the same um, copyright as raw file data. So you have a lot of freedom uh, to use that from pairs, and that's the service you're you're buying into literally um, when you uh, have a subscription. So uh, so you can do a lot with that. Um, it's just a, uh, my only statement was about uh, trying to retrieve the original uh, data files off of the pairs a database, but you don't uh, have that in mind. So you could either, up, as in summary, upload your data with a certain process to do that, and you can download the pairs data and use it locally. And so land use versus time, yes, indeed, you could get what pairs has versus time. And I showed you a nice movie of, say, ocean temperature versus time. Once you download it, it can be in just minimalist form, maps versus time. I had 400 maps, and it really didn't take much. Um, several years worth of a monthly, you can do a daily and so on. Um, you could do NDVI, which comes every hour. You can uh, do the average or sum for a, a day, uh, do uh, download the daily images, make movies of that, or somehow combine that with other land use daily. You can go back uh, for years and years. Because once it's highly reduced into this form, you can easily put it onto your own laptop. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we have a quick question from uh, Evan Nilton. Uh, and the question, is, or it's more of a comment, but um, so in order to download the data from pairs, is it required for you to be a premium member? Well, in fact, I don't know all the little rules because I'm in the pairs group. Um, so that is a question I have to ask beyond. I thought there was a, a freemium version. I don't know what you can download and whether that means a premium member. So these are all, Okay. first of all, they're encouraging questions because it seems <laughs> they like your product. convinced you of, of the enormous value of this for many, many things, a, a government science just browsing around for your own interest. Um, so I will have to uh, get someone who can answer these. Okay, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. And then um, hopefully uh, we can put together a more comprehensive answer for the attendees and um, share that either via uh, the listserv or on the LinkedIn community of practice. That'd be great. I'll give my answer to Cebu. Okay, um, and then we have another question for from Cebu actually. Uh, <laughs> so please jump in. Um, thanks, Bruce. Um, I really liked uh, today's presentation. I just have a question, just a follow on to your response to Christopher. I mean, you mentioned that um, there's a tutorial being written up on how to add your own data and that you know there's some restrictions in terms of the availability of some of the data like you you'd have to uh, perhaps get it um yourself from 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 the european space agency and so forth the one question that i had because i know that one of the advantages of of um working with with the data in pairs is that the pre-processing has already been taken care of so in terms of alignment to the to the hierarchical grid um, some of the corrections, such as atmospheric corrections, have already been done. I was just wondering if, if you're now sort of like importing um, or yeah, importing your own data or data that you've sort of sourced from from ESA, whether as part of the the routine that's being written currently, some of these pre-processing steps, there'll be assistance with with that. Okay. Good, so um, you mentioned that first restrictions on uploading and that is true whenever you get data, 
uh, from some source that is that you take yourself, but you have to be careful of the licensing. I don't have to tell you this, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of that data is free to take, but the question is what you do with it. Um, and there are restrictions. So if you upload on that that data, which you retrieve from somewhere um, onto pairs, you have to be mindful of restrictions. If it's your own data with your camera or your um, a drone or something, you own that data. and and you may want to put restrictions on that yourself, which is just fine. Um, whether, and, and then the second point, Cebu, you mentioned about uh, um, data that's already been uh, modified, atmospheric corrections or whatever. There is a lot of that ready to use data already in the public offerings. For example, ESA already gives NDVI and cloud cover and atmospheric corrections and, and raw data gives many different types, weather data the same. Um, so that's already as a layer, nothing for you to do. Okay. If you're asking whether the, the pairs people have done their own, yes, they've made new layers and you could do that as well. Some of those mm -hmm. layers, uh, if, if you retrieve data, that layer will exist while you're doing that. If you have a, a, um, a cloud, session open you are making layers and they exist as long as that cloud session opens and you may want to store them or you or they may vanish when if you want when the uh, cloud session closes so and, and some of these layers you make uh, uh, can be made a uh, permanent because they're useful for other people so there are examples of that uh, so any of this can be done either by yourself or if there's general interest in the pairs group, ask them to do it because you've just invented this new index, which is really cool. And they can make a new layer of that and provide it for general use, things like that. It's very flexible. Okay. I think that helps because I'm just worried maybe uh, um, around the spatial um, misalignment issue because I mean, the data would have to be aligned to the specific grid that is being used yeah. on for the pairs yeah. platform. Right. The uh, at the very beginning, I showed an overview, and that's done for you by pairs. Mm, okay. That is automatic mm. because mm. so that that occurs uh, right here in the data curation part. There, I call the gritter, where it assigns the key for its location and time. It puts it on a grid. It may do this in a regular schedule. It extracts the metadata and uh, and does all of this with multi-thread, so very fast and in parallel. So um, that's done for you. Cool. It it I think uses it's... the metadata. So a satellite file will have some positional information, maybe a, a corner position. Uh, you'll know the pixel size, so every pixel location can be found, and it can take that pixel and interpolate between pixels or smooth them however you want to do it but usually it's stored at higher resolution so that you uh, retain that um, the fidelity of the raw data and uh, and will interpolate and place it on the pairs uh, hierarchy so you don't have to do any alignment and any of the orientation it's just a pixel pixel has no orientation it's put mm -hmm. down pixel by pixel those files are totally unwrapped and replaced cool I think that I think that was important to reiterate again as we start yeah. to thinking about uh, think about the addition of our own some of our own data sets we might have. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Sabrina. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining. I think that that wraps it up for right now. A lot of good questions. Um, so that's very appreciated. And again, if you have follow-up questions, feel free to post on the LinkedIn community of practice. Um, I know that we're trying to get more dialogue happening there. Um, and everybody does have really good questions. So we, we want them to keep them coming. Um, and then on uh, my end, I will communicate with Bruce to see um, if we can learn some more about uh, using pairs and, and having um, a membership or, or how that works. Um,
So thanks everyone. Um, and we will see you next week. I think next week might be happening. Yes, at the same time. So um, thank you so much, Bruce. We really appreciate you these past two weeks. And thank you. My pleasure. Have a good rest of the day, everyone.